Stimp Digital presents Idle Game Chat. Cool. from Dimp Digital. Welcome to Idle Game Chat. Bonus stage. We are here to finally reveal Dimp Digital's Game of the Year for 2022. I'll be hosting alongside the man of the moment. It's that man. It's Hall back in his usual seat once a year. We wheel him out for this to chat Dragged shit. Dragged out of retirement. Dragged yeah. out of retirement to talk rubbish about a number of video <laughs> games that he probably hasn't played. He hasn't touched them. Get them away from me. How's it going? Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. You? <clears throat> Can't complain. Weather's turning, I think. So hopefully it'll start getting a bit warmer consistently, drier consistently. Yeah. At that awkward stage now, though, it rains and then there's a lot of sunshine, so all the weeds really have a field day. Yeah. Have to, be, have to be kept on top of. Nope. So annoying. Anyway, the rundown for this episode is as usual. Uh, I think we've got five games here that were nominated and put forward, and then one of those will ultimately be crowned Game of the Year 2022 for Dimp Digital. And we're going to go through those in chronological order of release date. Then we'll probably take a little pause to discuss some of the other, I wouldn't say honourable mentions, because some of the (laughs) mentions aren't honourable at all, but some other games that people put forward and didn't make the grade, it went through the the Game of the Year committee and flushed out all the crap, basically, and left us with with these five, we hope. But um, are you ready to get into this, sir? I am. I was built ready. Let's go. Let's go. So 2022... I've wrote all the dates down as 2023, actually, on my little notes here. So I've Blame really, that. really Early doors. That. Yeah, that's not very good. But um, we kick things off on the 8th of February. Sifu arrives on PlayStation Sifu. and PC. Yes, yeah, Sifu. Beat em up. Developed yeah, what by a, Slow What a strange Trap. one. What yeah. a strange one. Like, what's something that we haven't seen in a long time? Mm. A beat em up style. Yeah. Um thing and by slow clap as well who i mean what else have they even done anything they've done one other game i can't even remember what it's called but it wasn't high profile like i remember looking into it thinking yeah i'm not really sure of these guys that's always the concern when these new newer games appear you kind of think what have you what have you done for me lately yeah for sure came out of the park early february scored a pretty respectable 81 on open critic Mm. Um, which is what we use for our fantasy gaming league. Initially was a exclusive to PlayStation and PC, but as we record this, it's now available on all platforms, or should I say once it goes live, it will be. Um, and yeah, this was um, seen as a bit of a hard-as-nails game. There's not a lot of forgiveness in this. They have introduced easier modes now, as, the, as time's gone on, but a mm-hmm. difficult and demanding game that rewarded, I guess, mastery of the controls... And I guess one of the unique things about it that sounds like it could be really cool, but also equally annoying in some aspects, is the way it handles death in that your character, if you die during a level, your character will resurrect and they'll age up. Like a little tick will come along and say, right, you're, you've gone from age 20 to 25. Mm-hmm. And that changes your character's ability slightly. It gives you more damage output. So as you get older, you can hit harder, put people down with, with less sort of effort, but your overall health reduces. So it's kind of one of those things you really want to be getting into this as young as possible and staying there, but you, you inevitably will die. There is a cutoff point, you get to a certain age and get too old, you'll die for good, and you have to restart that entire level again uh, from, cool. the, from the age you entered it. And as you, as you sort of work your way through like the five levels or so, say if you enter at the first level on the youngest age, let's say it's 20, you get through that at the age of 28, you get to level two, your, your starting age will be 28 for that that area Mm. so if you were to die you'd still go back to that so it's actually a bit of a battle of trying to get through the levels without dying too many times yeah manage that age yeah throughout the whole game game. yeah and there's i mean biff was telling me that he basically got halfway through and restarted almost went back to the first one because he knew he could get through it without dying at all and then he was in better positions and and whatnot but yeah 3d beat him up martial arts train the combat looks excellent it's looks very difficult and um 
one that's made it onto our list here. Yeah, it was a strange one, this, because as I say, I mean, like, the beat em up style gameplay like this is, is well, I mean, it all but died, hadn't it, really? Like, there wasn't... Well, in this form, not... especially, like, you yeah. may, maybe you're seeing an old retro throwback that's trying to capture, like, an old Streets of Rage. Like, Streets of Rage 4 came out a year or so ago, but that's a very yeah, retro-inspired and... That's it. This was like game. a new IP, yeah. completely new style of everything. And as you say, like, with the with the death mechanic and the fact that they openly came out and said it's meant to be difficult, we want yeah. there to be a steep learning curve to give yeah. people the feeling of properly mastering um like the kung fu style combat in it yeah. um which yeah completely completely different to what we'd been dealing with up to that point so yeah was, uh, i'm surprised it was as well received as it was i was quite the skeptic before it came out thinking that it was going to be a bit of a flash in the pan and the thing is like i say it's one of those things because it is so unique it's proper easy to get wrong like it would yeah. have been very easy for them to make this into an app to absolutely chuff this yeah i mean biff as you say played it and played it a lot and seemed to enjoy it a lot he was one of the ones that put it forward for yeah for the list um neither you or nor i have picked it up but i don't know i mean I, I, it's getting round to play we've said it before on this podcast last year that it takes a game to be really good to warrant my time to play it. Mm. Maybe it is really good. Maybe I've been unfair on it up till now, but it was just like one of those ones that I was like, eh, shall I, shan't I? Maybe I will play it at some point, but yeah, it's yeah, hard. Hard to find time for it when there's a lot of other stuff around. And I can imagine it's one of those ones that's... You're either going to, like I say, you're either going to really enjoy yourself with it or you're yeah. going to be like, nah, fuck this. I'm not into this at all. <laughs> yeah, like, I, can see, I can see a lot of people picking it up and then putting it down quite quickly. Yeah, it definitely. Won't, I think the steep learning curve there is something to be a bit of a buyer beware. You've kind of got to commit to it and understand you're probably going to get your ass kicked, you know, for a good portion of the game if, if you don't choose any of the easier difficulty Options, levels, which, which yeah. I can never bring myself to do. I don't know why. Like there's so no, many games. That. There's so many games that I play. And I think this is really fucking annoying me. But <laughs> I could just turn the difficulty down. And I think no, I'm not letting myself do that. And then I end up hating uh, the game I've for started. it. Yeah, exactly. I've started, yeah. so I'll quit or I'll finish. But Deve I won't lower the difficulty. No, and developers are like, well, I've given you the option there, and you're like, no, sorry, too late. Sort it too out. Too late. <laughs> sort yeah. it out. But no, Sifu marched its way onto the list. It said it's a nice early release in February. 8th of Feb, and actually, as we get through the next two games, they're also... Feb February had three of our five in them. In it was what, a big month, on it? That's another reason why, for me, Sifu didn't get through, because I was anticipating one of those games, and perhaps the other one, depending on reviews, and I was like, well, it's got 10 days before that. I don't really want to get snarled up in something that's difficult, demanding that I'm going to have to... I want to... You know, if you're going to play Sifu, my recommendation is to play it and finish it, you know, yeah, in, in a reasonable finish. time. Don't take yeah. a break because it's one of those games you'll come back to a month lose. later and be like, well, yeah. I can't even get through the first zone, let alone an entire level. Yeah, it should be a testament to it, really, that given, like, when you when you look at the list of five games that we've got, I think three of them would probably be on most people's lists. Um, yeah. yeah. Potentially even four. And Sifu's kind of maybe the outlier. But yeah. the fact that it's earned a place in our top five, I think, is a credit to it, especially when, as you say, the month that it came out, in was so stacked for big yeah. big releases like anticipated releases as well that mm. it did really well to be to not just completely fly under the radar i mean yeah. it got nominated for bits and pieces at the game awards didn't it for yeah, independent yeah. game and actually like it's not like it was completely overlooked critically either no. so yeah testament to um to the game that it's done as well as it has given the circumstances in which it was released yep and I say it's available on all platforms now, so you can go out and buy that if you've got a Switch, if you've got an Xbox, if you're on PC, you could have played it anyway, but PlayStation is where it initially launched, but it's there for everyone. And Sifu mm -hmm. takes its place at the table. Number two, this is the one I was talking about when I was talking about anticipation, and it's Horizon Forbidden West, sitting on an 88 on Open Critic, 18th of February 2022. PlayStation 4 and PS5 only as we speak, but we expect one day it'll be ported to PC, as Sony have been doing in the last couple of years. 
mm-hmm. putting over their first party stuff. Action, oh sorry, an open world action RPG. Guerrilla Games developing this, published by Sony, so it's a first party release. And a, a direct sequel to 2017's Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn. And for me, the big story about Forbidden West is just... Once again, the game releases and then within like a week or 10 days, maybe a couple of weeks, the oxygen and the energy is sucked away by another game, which mm-hmm. is El- which is Elden Ring in this case. Zero Dawn had the same issue five years ago, or well, it'd be six now, um, with Breath of the Wild arriving on its doorstep after release. And everyone went, well, that's it. That's Ooh, the second uh... coming. And then uh, just an unfortunate timing again here for Forbid- Forbidden West. I think it got a bit of a... Wait, well, 88 is no disgrace, but I do feel like the conversation almost immediately stopped once Elden Ring came out and people didn't really get time to marinate on what I thought was an excellent traditional open world game. Yeah, I think a lot of people seem to think that of this as well. Obviously, building on the successes of the first one, which, again, I think we had it on the uh, our Game of the le- Year list when mm. Zero Dawn came out. Yeah. Um, and was pretty unanimously loved by everyone within the DIMP group that played it. And much the same again, like Guerrilla have done a... The IP, I think, will be around for a while. They've obviously done... There's there's an expansion coming out this year for it, and yep. they've got a VR game as well. Yep. Um, cool which, the Yeah, which looks... I must admit, look quite cool. Um, a good use of the, the new PSVR 2. But yeah, the IP will be around for a while. I anticipate seeing more of these, given the success of these two. And this one was, by all accounts, again from what I've heard, a an improvement on the on the first game uh, as uh, as an improved sequel. Yeah, that absolutely was an improvement. Some of the scruffiness from 2017's Zero Dawn was kind of rectified. They blasted open the the world, made it bigger, a bit more vast, more enemies and encounters to do more objectives and and tasks to be getting on with um, which is not always uh sorry interrupting but that's that's not always like a, a guarantee either when no. they make something so much bigger yeah. like it's it's not unusual now for people to go our oh, bigger's better we'll just fucking blast the, the landscape wide open so they did well to get a balance between making it have that much more to it but still keeping it relevant if that makes sense yeah absolutely they the, the biggest I think one of the biggest criticisms of 2017's Zero Dawn was um, like the facial animations during dialogue scenes. Like, right. They were very stilted, very wooden. Like, yeah. lip, lip syncing was a little bit out. The eyes just sort of blinked. And that was, there was no facial expression to any of this. Yeah. Forbidden West, I mean, maybe I've, it's not, I've not played a Naughty Dog game in a while, but <laughs> this may well be one of the best in terms of facial animation I've seen on a video, let, let alone a massive open world game. It really is astounding what they did with Forbidden West in that on that area. They clearly took that criticism to heart and went, well, we'll show, right, you, what, yeah, we'll show well, you what you can do. And the characters, their, their mannerisms, you can you can almost tell how they're feeling just from their facial expressions and obviously the dialogue accompanying it. But that was not something that was possible before because they were just wooden sort of like little characters standing there and they, they, they look yeah. like it they improved on the, the direct in front of there as well making the even just like simple things like changing the camera angles during dialogue everything was just looked at and refined better better mm. loads of new weapons new traversal traversal options that really open up the game and a, a nice new setting in the in the sort of western side of the of the america lands vegas and san francisco and all that sort of stuff and mm. yeah I spent over 100 hours in this, which... Um, cool, real investment. A real investment in there and enjoyed pretty much every minute of it. So, And no, I assume you'll be doing the uh, expansions when they come out? Yeah, the expansion, which is due out later in April, I'll be getting. Um, and at the cost of something like Star Wars Jedi F, um, Survivor, because that's out a week later. And mm. in my head, I'm like, I can only commit to one of them at day one. I may as well just opt for the story DLC. Yeah, um, fair. So that's going to that's managed to beat out a new sort of big release in a way because I'm that excited about jumping back into the game. I do feel like I'm going to need to play the game a week before just to just to go back through it and get yourself with where you're at. Yeah, I mean, it's, it'll be April by the time it comes out. It's like what's that? 13, 14 months basically. That's yeah. a bit too long for story DLC, if you ask me. You want that within a year time frame, if yeah, not you- six to nine months, ideally. It's obviously where they've been working on, like I say, on like the VR game that comes alongside it. The studio's probably been 
been doing that in in conjunction. I was going to ask you the um, you played it on PS5 rather than PS4, obviously. Yeah. Did you did you play on higher frame rate, lower resolution, the 60 FPS performance mode, or did you play it on just 4K, make it look beautiful? I'm not fussed about the fact that I'm probably only getting 30 to 45 max. Yeah, I went for the frame rate option. I just always do now. Mode. Yeah, I always put performance mode on. And um, that was something that 2017 didn't have because it was on PS4. Mm -hmm. There was no 60 FPS option. It does have that now, actually. If you play it on PS5, it's got a yeah. little extra toggle there to play it at 60 FPS. But no, I went for the, the performance mode. And yet, the game still looked stunning. Even, outrageous, even, yeah. even, It was outrageously good for a game that big. Like, it yeah. really is a beautiful game. Um, and the setting is still unique now this is the second take on it so it's not as not not as big a statement as it perhaps mm. was five years ago but certainly an interesting enough world and a third game it seems like almost a given at this point and hopefully that'll, yeah, sure. that, that'll round out a nice solid meaty open world trilogy but yeah it's getting to the stage where the next one as well i think will probably be a ps5 exclusive no ps4 mm. model in sight so it'll be good because that'll be an I mean, you'd imagine it'd be at least a couple of years away. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say that. Cause it almost certainly will be because the story DLC, uh, the Burning Shores, which is coming, that's PS5 only. Ah, so that, okay. So, so, so even that is not going to be backported to PS4. That's what they said at the moment. They could well in six months go, well, we've done it. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But at the initially, minute. initially they're not doing that. So I'm, I'm kind of half got an eye on that thinking, what, are they, what exactly are they going to show me that... They couldn't yeah, do, it'd be good perhaps. to see what happens in that. If there's anything in that that you go, crikey, this is, uh, yeah, this is an improvement. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'd love, I mean, I've made my feelings about that kind of thing very clear in the past. I want games for next gen now. I don't want them to be, to be peddling me a PS4 game on with a PS5 skin on the box. So yeah. that's good. Good to see. And it'd be interesting to see what, how that, a, how that um, DLC plays out, but also what the next, the next installment, which will inevitably come, looks like. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could do it being not another five years. I mean, this took five years to come yeah. for the sequel, but we'll see. We'll see. They may, maybe they've got ideas. Maybe they've scaled up. Who knows? But um, looking forward to the, the DLC and certainly whatever they do in the future, Gorilla still onto a winner there. Um, mm. And uh, it's unfortunate, like I said, that the conversation around it kind of got, got sullied out of it because next on the list, Elden Ring decided to arrive. 20, 25th of February, 2022. Um, I thought this was going to do well. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> I wasn't personally anticipating it that much because I kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with From, From Software games. I liked and loved Bloodborne. Bloodborne, sorry. But in equal measures, hated it during certain <laughs> moments during the game. It really is one of those, those sort of Marmite situations where I can... You know, yeah, you can dislike it, and and obviously the the tagline for this was well, Dark Souls goes open world, and I was a bit like, well, mm. you enjoyed Sekiro though, didn't you? I didn't play it. Well, oh, did you not? No, I didn't play Sekiro um, because oh, okay. the reason I didn't play Sekiro is because it doesn't have the RPG elements in it. So yeah. there's, there's no leveling of character and building yeah. out stats. You kind of just the gameplay is the it's gameplay, flat, which, yeah. which actually a lot of people enjoyed more because Preferred, it was yeah. it was it was almost all skill based. But I liked, as you know, and you know you probably do the same in your JRPGs. I like to try and just if I want to, got to sit there in ten hours and I'm, grind just so I can. I'm going to be horrifically I, overpowered and just, absolutely decimate everything. Yeah. yeah, which is still hard in these games, but you can sort of brute force your way through. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't an option in Sekiro, and I was a bit, oh, I'm a bit scared off from this, so I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to do it. But Elden Ring comes out and ends up being one of the highest scoring games in the last few years. A 95. Yeah, outrageous. On Open Critic. From software back at it. I mean, did you even see this level of praise coming? I can't imagine many people did, but there'll be the odd person that will claim they did. No way. I, I mean, when we were doing the draft for last year, I had this on my list, but it was no, it was nowhere near in my top ten. Like no. it wasn't close because it was. It's one of those things that because all of the other Soulsborne games had been relatively linear, they obviously had their yeah, they had the reputation for being rock hard, which the diehard fans loved. Yep. Um, but yeah, this was a bit of a step in a, in a direction they hadn't necessarily been before, although it obviously had all the similar mechanics. So you knew it was, it was never going to bomb. No. But, 
uh, you know, it was one of those. Oh, okay, it, it's probably going to be. It's probably going to be good, but I don't think anyone anticipated it being the phenomenon that it was. I mean, like you say, considering the games that it came out with that month, and it just flattened everything. It mm-hmm. was everything became Elden Ring. All the big streamers were playing it. Everyone yep. was jumping on it. Um, and it was a badge of honor, wasn't it, for those that had completed it? Like yeah, posting, yeah. posting photos online of bosses they'd finally defeated and it was just it, it was crazy the world of like the gaming world went Elden Ring mad for I mean, a long time as well it wasn't like it it wasn't like a flash in the pan like nope. it, it it was everything for a good few uh, like a several month period yeah it is ginormous and the, the the I guess the thing that surprised me the most was the critical reception for one definitely like whenever you see something yeah. that's i mean it's fourth highest rated game on open critic of all time i think they go back at least 10 years now so it's mad. Only, the only games above it are mario odyssey breath of the wild which was the second coming this is now the third coming and then red dead 2 um sure. and it's sitting there fourth on its own going yeah that's, that's mental we, that is what we can do so that was like shocking in itself but then to see the sales like this clearly broke out from like as, as Logan calls them, like the the nerds in the alleyways that were playing from software games before and championing it. Like that's that yeah. sort of five to ten million people, the hardcores, and is now on to well over twenty million sales. It's clearly broken out into a much more broader audience. Yeah, I think, brand new IP. It's like it's unbelievable. Yeah, I think that's a testament to to the game itself because, as I mentioned, or as you said just then, there's the real hardcore group that love. The from software games love all the soulsborne stuff that they love how difficult it is and i mean you even mentioned it on the previous that that puts people off yeah like how difficult these games are there's no two ways about it it puts people off and it put a lot of streamers off on previous iterations because no one wants to see someone fucking be stuck on the same thing <laughs> over and over and over again like it's yeah. not entertaining to watch but with this the game was so good and there was so much to it like the storyline was was meant to be amazing they brought in fucking George R R didn't they to, he to did do the, the story on. he did that like, the law based on it so yeah, all yeah. The, so there was the, like the bible of it's basically written by him can't finish That's his it. own books but he's off doing no, that he's, he's up here money's right he'll do whatever <laughs> um, but yeah like it it was it was it drew, it drew in people from way outside of the normal the normal Soulsborne um audience yeah and that like i say is a testament to how strong the game was in comparison to everything that had come beforehand mm. i am super I, mean, I assume someone in bandai namco published it and then from software so, uh, uh, developed it someone going right we need to do a second one of this i mean you know, clearly you'd think from a business perspective needs to happen at some point. I am fascinated to see what happens with the second one. Does it hit the same, not even review wise, I'm talking sales wise. How many of those people that had to go through this trial by fire, come back for more gladly yeah. of punishment or are they put off by it? I am super interested in that. Mm-hmm. My it'd, be interesting, it'd be interesting to see if it, if it, if it doesn't review as well as the first one, because I think mm. the thing is, like I say, this was so critically acclaimed and so many people seem to absolutely get on board with it and love it that if it, it feels unlikely that it would not sell as well you know yeah. um, but if it doesn't review as well will the sales still be there will people blindly follow into it or as this one I, I, yeah it'd be interesting to see yeah. i like you say i think again as you mentioned a second one will be in the works already yeah i, I can't imagine them ditching or, or switching back to a Dark Souls or Bloodborne or no. or even a Sekiro, a second Sekiro. I, I can't imagine that they'll change away from this IP for at least the next the next game in the series, whatever that's going to be. No, I, I I tend to agree with that. This has to be, this kind of has to be the, the next go when they do this this type of game again. Because there's Armored mm. Core that's supposedly coming in maybe this year or next year, which is something that's been in the work before Elden Ring release. So it was, you know, it's a project they're finishing off there. But um, super interested to see what their next iteration of Elden Ring will be, Elden Ring 2 or whatever they decide to call it. Because they did a trilogy of Dark Souls. They did eventually splinter off with Bloodborne, which was a bit different, and Sekiro. So they're not afraid to divert away. But this was such a resounding success from all levels, whether it's critical or commercial. Like, yeah, well, it'd be hard. It'd be hard. It'd to be just, hard. Not, at least initially, not just to go back to the well and say, what can we do here? Yeah. Um, I think I spent about... I think I, I finished it. I say finished it. I got to the credits the game is ginormous which i think is one of the things that people love and i no doubt well no i did i missed several bosses that optional stuff like the game really is just huge yeah 
about 80 or 90 hours, I think, I spent in it. Um, and, yeah, the, the combat is... It's more diverse than I think people give it credit for. You can really, mm-hmm. you can really commit to like very different builds. I think that's where I would enjoy tweaking more is, is sussing out builds and certain weapon types. Like you can actually build, do a build that uses like the old Castlevania whip. Like how cool would that be to yeah. just power up on that? Like there's there's tons you can dual wield weapons. There's big great swords, or you can just be magic. You know, range scum on your horse just firing fucking boulders at people but then when you get hit once you die so there's all these different balances you have to do. but you can really have a lot of fun building and, and messing Playing around with your ways yeah. your character trying out all the different types of weapon the weapon sorry the the open world is just ridiculously big it just almost feels like it keeps on growing it's like a fucking onion you just keep going and unlocking new areas you know there's verticality to it and you just think where when when is this going to stop but the one thing that really stood out at least got a lot of the conversations going and actually what was used to sort of beat something like horizon forbidden west around the head was that it took a more or sorry a less traditional approach to open world minimal quest markers yeah no, no quest log no busy work quote unquote no checklists um, very little in terms of direction. And um, that was really what fueled a lot of the, the praise for the game outside of the combat and, and whatnot. There, there, there was the, 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 the trust, I guess, that they put in the players to explore and find things on their own or what most people do is use a guy, let's be honest, find all the good weapons. But how does that type of formula... Because this is sort of like we had this with Breath of the Wild a little bit as well. They, you know, the the fun of that game was to just go off and explore, do, explore yeah. and do whatever. But these, 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 there's two games that have kind of come out that have got huge critical acclaim for just doing that and not being like a what people would call a Ubisoft style game. You know, where you have yeah. like your, your towers and things. Forbidden West had you know multiple quest markers, side quests, activity, all this stuff to do that's all logged somewhere. Whereas this is a more minimalist approach. But how do you feel about that? direction of open world games i think the thing is with my my problem and i know it's one that you have as well is i don't like knowing that i've actively left something yeah. unfinished <laughs> yeah like if i if i have exactly that like a quest log with a load of bits and pieces it will bother me and i will slowly grind through them at the yeah. at the yeah, and what ha- ends up happening? Oh, I won't enjoy the game because I'm too busy trying to tick things off on a list. Yeah, yeah. I'm too busy trying to collect shit or finish <laughs> things off. And one of the things that I loved about Breath of the Wild was that I thought I'd done borderline everything. Mm. I go and fight the final boss, and I'm like, oh, wicked, that was satisfying. Yeah. And then you look online, and it's like, oh no, you missed fucking sixty shrines, and yeah. there's nine hundred. Korok seeds, by the way, and it's like oh, okay, I have like I have like fucking thirty of them, you know. So it's and I didn't kick myself for not having done them first time round. It's just the oh well, hang on a minute, I wasn't necessarily looking for those, but now I'm going to be a little bit more astute when I'm pondering about and knowing what's going on. So I think that giving people the like you say the option, if you want to go off and explore and you want to find stuff, you probably will do. Yeah. But at the same time, if you are going through with relative blinkers on you're not going to feel like you've missed out on loads and like if you're someone like me you get snarled up on oh i've still got that thing to finish off over there or whatever it's it uh, i think there's a lot to be said for it from the fact that both this and as you say breath of the wild which has kind of got a similar similar style of thing going on yeah um being as successful as they are i think it just it appeals again to the more like we've already said that you put 100 hours plus into into forbidden west God yeah. knows how many hours you put into Elden Ring. Mm. It could, but that's the half the fun of it. It could have been I could have put fifty more into Elden Ring easily. Exactly, that's what I mean. And it could have been that you only put in twenty, thirty hours and just kind of ploughed through and felt like you did enough of the game to get a decent understanding of what had happened with it. Yeah. Or you could put two hundred hours in and still be like, oh, there's still some more shit that I could probably discover and do. So, yeah, I think it's. I, I definitely don't think it's a bad way to head in terms of open world games. There's still a place for ga- games that have got like that that collection or that that quest line or you know markers on maps and stuff like that yeah i definitely still think there's a place for that within within gaming but i don't at the same time i think games like this are going to grow in popularity because 
like in this style that we've just spoken about because people don't want the overwhelming burden of having six bazillion things that they still have to do before they feel like they can finish a game. Yeah, I, I tend to. I think the for me the ultimate would be some sort of hybrid between the two. There's got to be a happier middle ground where I haven't got to write down my own fucking quest log. Yeah. Which which I kind of had to do in this because yeah. you talk to someone and they're like oh the castle's northwest of here um, yeah you know my daughter's there or whatever. it could be anything like that and unless you remember that or go and do it immediately it doesn't track that anywhere it just no all you I just wanted was it. all I wanted was a conversation tracker really but yeah I, I, to, I, tell you, you. to tell yeah. me that what had been said so I could just look at things and it could be as cryptic as you like but I just want something there to refer to in game but I was making my own bloody notepad writing down what these clowns were saying and these riddles. So there is, You're scurrying through notes as you get to somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And so I think there is a hybrid to be had where certain things are tracked potentially or certain information is at least tracked for you and you're not just left completely alone. But I think given that this was a, you know, a first attempt from From Software, um, they clearly yeah. lent on the more, you know, less is more approach in terms of giving the player guidance and clearly clearly has paid off for them it's worked yeah. um and i appreciated some of the changes they made also just in like their core structure of the of the gameplay and how they how they design it like one of the things that infuriated me with with bloodborne was you'd get to a boss room a die like you know very rarely you meet a boss first time i think yeah Adkins, to be fair, I saw him do the first boss first time. I was like, well, I've never seen that before. I'm sure loads of people have, but I was, I was a little bit annoyed that he didn't get immediately murked like Stumbled I did. Up, yeah. Yeah. yeah, But anyway, like you normally will die the first time you encounter a boss. But then you, you'd respawn at a, you know, a bonfire or a, you know, they're a lamp actually in Bloodborne. But it'd be mm -hmm. like a good 90 minute sprint through other enemies just to get back to the boss, just to die again. Yeah. Like it was an infuriating loop when you kind of thought you had yeah. the beating of it, but then you get there and get caught by some fucking guy of a crossbow that takes down the like half your hair off. And then you've got to use a healing item that you kind of need for the boss fight. Yeah. They actually introduced something called stake of Marika in um, Elden Ring where most, and this is kind of one of little small things that annoy me, Most of the bosses have a spawn point right outside their room. Yeah. So you just die. You can just go straight back in if you want, or you can piss off and do something else, power yeah. up and come back. And I really appreciated that because it cuts so much of the what I saw as nonsensical tracking through and yeah. risk of just just trying to get to fight the thing. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't there for every boss. I don't know why that inconsistency was there. Like there was a couple where there wasn't a stake of America there, and I was a bit like, yeah. I don't understand your logic here, but whatever. But for the vast majority of them there was an option just to kind of start from outside the room and have another go at it almost immediately, which is, I really appreciated. Yeah. I think that's going to go a long way to keeping the casual audience engaged because as you say, that would fucking, that would really bother me. Yeah. A lot. Like, especially like, it's not so <clears throat> obviously depending on how long it is, but you know how infuriating it is when you get a boss down to like an absolute slither of health. Yep. And then you fall at the final hurdle, it'd just mm. be the absolute icing on the cake. Especially some of those bosses were not quick to kill either. No, no, yeah. <clears throat> you take a bit of a battering, so they definitely were not easy to do. And usually you'd have to get through like a gauntlet to get to the boss. So you've, mm. you don't want to have to keep going through that gauntlet, then have to take the boss on. Like That seemed like an unnecessary step. So they took steps to remediate that in most cases, which I, which I appreciated. But yeah. there was just tons in this game. Like <clears throat> bosses, enemies, caves, dungeons worlds to go off and, and explore and um yeah it's, it's certainly been a if this wasn't the breakout if, if dark souls and bloodborne wasn't a breakout hit or considered one for from software then this certainly was and it's blown yeah. them into a, a new audience and you know as i said highest scoring game of, of last year and a multi-time game of the year award winner so elden ring very much the game of 2022 for many many people mm -hmm. um like I said, that's all three of those games are in the month of February. What a start to the year. Yeah, and then almost had nothing until the back end of the year. It's a bit of a strange front load. Yeah. And things like um, Dying Light 2 will also come out in February, basically sent to the wolves. Like, if you weren't playing Seafood, if you weren't playing Horizon, then you, weren't, then you were playing Elden Ring. Like, games like that just got completely annihilated in the, yeah. in the month of February, which ended up being a ridiculously stacked year but we yeah. we get all the way to july before our next game pops up 
And this has actually been nominated several times at several other award ceremonies, probably lesser ones, I would say, than us. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously this is the most prestigious award any of them can win. But it is Stray, Cat Simulator, Adventure Game, 84 on Open Creek, 19th of July, 2022. PlayStation and PC only as we record and release this. Um, one of the, I think one of the things that helped this initially was this was Sony's first third-party day one release in their subscription service. Mm-hmm. So they, they revamped PlayStation Plus in 2022. They offered this three-tiered approach of essential, extra, and premium. Extra is kind of like the area where you get access to a load of games to download, like a Game Pass-ish equivalent just yeah. without the first party games being delivered. And this was one of the first third party games that, that launched on the same day where you could buy it, but also launched in the subscription service. And I think that gave it a real leg up yeah. just in terms of visibility. Debut game also from Blue 12 Studios. So you won't find many of their previous games lurking. And if you like cats, this game really seemed to, to resonate with people. It ticks a lot of boxes. It ticks a lot of boxes. Now, I will say, in you know conversing with people... There are a lot of anti cat people out there. Like not just neutral, don't give a shit either way, but like anti no, they're little pricks type energy coming off people. Where do you stand on the cat debate? Yeah, I'm, I'm like that with animals, full stop, mate. You're asking the wrong person. You got kids, they're animals. Yeah, they are, and I dislike <laughs> them immensely. <laughs> yeah. It was it's not there no, yeah. No place for animals in my home at all. This was a... Uh, yeah, but it's funny because, like, obviously, again, in that exact conversation, the DIMP group, I think, is relatively evenly divided between mm. doesn't mind cats, hates cats. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, again, everyone that played this, and as you say, I think it helped in the manner in which it was released, but for a, an indie studio as a first release, what a fucking way of announcing your way onto the... Uh, like into the party with um, a game that was pretty, again, pretty well critically acclaimed across the board. Yeah, like I said, a solid 84. That's that's really good. And um, has been nominated for tons of awards across the various awards ceremonies, with best debut, and even like it's been in the best game and game of the year nominations for, for many of them. So it's made the mainstream and the, and the other kind of like critical or uh, industry pretty, awards. Yeah, pretty much unanimously won debut game any yeah. debut game um award there was and any indie indie game award yeah. that there was it pretty much unanimously swept um across all the big all the big um like award ceremonies and as you say to be even i mean we've obviously got it on our list but to be mentioned in when you look at the the other games that it's up against and the size of the studios and the money <laughs> that they have at their disposal yeah. in comparison to to Blue Twelve, who I mean, let's be, we uh, still don't know anything about them, really, do we? No, because this really. is this is it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, like, fair play to them. They what a, what a way of announcing themselves onto the scene. Yeah, I think it's an interesting game, just to the fact that you are a cat. Again, like we talk about this name, the last cat game that came out. <laughs> it's just like, again, they just don't they just don't exist, do they? And. <laughs> And actually, the the idea of being a cat might sound, you think, well, a bit boring. But actually, they're, they're nice and agile. You know, you can get up to high. Play. A lot of the game is platforming, and and it's not even it's not even challenging platforming because it's actually contextually like you just look at where you want to go and hit the button, and you'll jump there. So it's not like you've got to jump and like aim and make sure you've got the right sort of velocity going so you make the jump. The game does all that for you, so it's really simple in that aspect. But there mm. was something just endearing about roaming around this futuristic sort of robot inhibited world as this cat just trying to get back to the pack of cats that you started the game with you fell down this <laughs> little, fell down this bloody hole and then you're like oh I need to get out of here and go and see my mates yeah I mean it's it's funny you saying that about um, just being a cat game obviously where you control a cat what was the last cat game I mean what was the last game where you were an animal that wasn't anthropomorphized in some way. Mm. Like normally you are an animal, but you've got some kind of sentience. You can hold things you play or whatever, you know, when was the last time that you were, I mean, because as you say, you're you're a cat. There's not, there's nothing more to it. But when was the last time we had a game like that, where you were an animal behaving as an animal does not, not in any way kind of, 
no powers, no nothing like that. It's bizarre. Yeah. And amazing that something like that has been as as popular and as um well has has got enough there to keep people entertained. Yeah. No, it's nice. It was a nice sort of simple war. I'm sorry. And... <laughs> I'm just reading, I'm reading the fucking Wikipedia page in front of me. Optional activities include sleeping, meowing, <laughs> and nuzzling up to non-player characters. Yes. Like what the fuck? So if you want to spend it? if you want to spend time simulating as a cat, you can do all that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It does have some level of sort of combat's a bit of a stretch, but you get basically this jacket that allows you to like send like shock waves out and has like a light on it and things like that and there's certain areas of like where you can get chased down and you've got to avoid enemies and, and whatnot. But mm. it's primarily like a puzzly adventure game where you've got to figure out how to get out of zone X or whatever it is and find find a way forward. But that, mm. that comes with interacting with the, the robots and whatnot. You've got a little companion that comes along with you that kind of translates what they're saying and it's how you can kind of interact with them. But very unique, enjoyable, sort of like a wholesome game. There's nothing really... There's no horrible ghouls that are coming out and trying to eat you and well there actually there was but it wasn't like it was a nice tone it wasn't like a horrible tone like Elden Ring where you've yeah. got these fucking horrible demons trying to gut you more, if, if, more kind of cyberpunky than it was yeah yeah and um, I don't know I really I really did like my time with this and enjoyed playing through it I think if you're a cat lover it's completely up your street if you're anti-cats then I don't know maybe that's where maybe that's why I didn't get a 94 some of the the anti-cat brigade got involved and went, right, <laughs> let's ding this. But I've seen it being people going like raising eyebrows why it's appearing at like the industry awards, like day like as in like the best game category, like the overall one. Mm. And um I kind of don't mind that at all. I thought it earned, kind of earned its place on as a solid, good, enjoyable game. And it's as we've stated, very unique. I think that's yeah. that, that that will that will resonate with people. I think you need games like this to be included in in awards and bits and pieces because we and we've had this problem before and we've said it before like how often is it that you just get your naughty dogs and your from softwares and yeah. you know all, all these big name studios that released and the Santa Monica's who released the same or Rockstar same style of game just all all you know oh we we want big open world we want massive um you know Deep, deep story, deep lore, and all the rest of it. You know, we want it all. We want that. That's and typically that's the kind of stuff that does well in the awards. And I'm not saying that something like Stray should necessarily win like a Game of the Year award. Mm. You know, it's obviously a much smaller game, a much smaller studio. But you've got to take time to appreciate that. Like I say, being a smaller industry indie studio to be able to compete against some of these other big name things that came out last year. It's impressive, and it's nice to see that recognised by people in um, in in award ceremonies. They even be mentioned in the same in the same breath as like an Elden Ring, for example. Yeah, yeah. it's. Um, I think it's good. You know, it's good to see it in there, and I think some of the criticisms of it, of it appearing in those <laughs> those those nominee lists were um, oh, an incorrect opinion, if you, if you dare say it. But it's, <laughs> you know, the game game got there on its own merits at the end of the day. And um, yeah. it deserved to be there for a reason, and I, I, I definitely enjoyed my time with it. <clears throat> so Stray lands itself in our nominee list. Final game. You know, so these are all in chronological order. 9th of November, twenty twenty two. God of War Ragnarok arrives on the scene. PS four and PS five again will probably come to PC in the the near to medium future. Sony Santa Monica following up. The 2018 God of War, which um, won many Game of the Year awards, won all four of the the big ones, so it was definitely well received back in 2018. So this had a huge amount of pressure on it. I felt like, like when you get games that are that well received, and a lot of the heavy weight that was carried in God of War 2018, in my view, was because they completely rebuilt Kratos as a character. You know, mm-hmm. made him interesting, not just some angry bald man like screaming <laughs> and shouting. And yeah. they grounded the gameplay a lot more. They took away like it wasn't he wasn't as agile. He doesn't jump. It's much more sort of heavy based melee focus. Sort of yeah, combat. It felt like he had some weight to him rather than yeah, rather than like spinning around and whatnot. So the fact that it was new, it was good, and Kratos got a new, completely new character almost, a new new personality 
which still mm-hmm. also, I must say, kept everything that happened in God of War 1 through 3 and the other games, the early games, are still part of the lore here. Like, yeah. He referenced, referenced heavily, especially in, in, in Ragnarok. But I yeah. did feel like that it caught, caught people off, off, you know, they were surprised by it. They was like, oh, it's this different. And that carries a lot of weight sometimes. But I, God of War Ragnarok comes out, even with all those expectations and... The, the tricks, the, well, the tricks already been exposed. We we know what they they're going to do with this franchise, mm. and still comes out to great success. Ninety three on Open Critic um, is a the concluding part of this North saga that they started with twenty eighteen. So mm. speculation was this will be easily a trilogy, like a lot of games and whatnot are. But they said no, we're going to pack this one with content and it really is packed with stuff to be getting on with side quests and all sorts and finish off this story arc in a second game um, because we don't want it dragging on for a decade you know, before yeah. we get to the end of this arc and yeah came out to very su- great success and interested to see your hear your thoughts on on this one because when I said it, it was at a hard job in its hand you you gave a little sort of oh that's, that's incorrect apps so clearly, maybe you thought it was on to a, on to a winner already. Yeah, I mean, I think when you've got something that was that worked so well, and it sounds unfair to say this, but they could have made a, a, they could have basically done a, a borderline re-release of God of War One. You know, change the change some of the cutscenes, change the environment a little bit, and it still would have been incredibly well received. I think that the first one did, or like the fourth whatever you want to call it the god of war the last one that came out um did such a good job of people like people were again unanimously raving about it saying what what an unbelievable game it was I, uh, yes okay it was hard to live up to perhaps the hype of that one but because that was such an overachiever or s- such a high achiever this one was always going to do reasonably well that said from the changes that they made and the things that you've, like you say, the fact that this was so packed with content, the amount of stuff that was going on with it, they did an unbelievable job with mm. making... It's so easy for a sequel to get lazy, to get to yeah. be a drop-off of the first one. And, you know, it's always a worry when you have a big release, especially, like I say, I mean, this was so hyped up, wasn't it? It was yeah. Everyone was in preparation for it. And then there was delays as well yeah. where we were waiting which again just builds on hype like there's nothing worse than having a delay and then another delay and you know people want the game to come out cr- at the right time but at the same time people want to fucking play, play it. it yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah you know so they did an unbelievable job of like and again like when you look at some of the other games that we've got on our list this was another one that was just unanimous across the board was just well received by everyone that played it yeah like even amongst the dimp group again I'm not a huge fan of like the hack and slash style um, gameplay that this was described as, but I think probably calling it that is maybe a little bit unfair because mm. I think hack and slash kind of has the connotations of being a bit of a button mangling kind of get in yeah. amongst it and go go buck wild, and that's not really what this was at all. No, no, it's a lot more deliberate and yeah, you know, you got a, it's. It's not an out and out. It is an action game. But it's not like what I'd call an out and out action game, like a Bayonetta or Devil May Cry. Yeah, you know, that, that yeah. Level. Devil May Cry is the one that I was kind of thinking of when you think when I think hack and slash, I think of that because it was just fucking charging and mangle. But yeah. this was a little bit more deliberate, and you had to be a little bit more cle- much like the first one again. But you yeah. have to be a little bit cleverer with your combat. Yeah, it's. I mean, that, the combat's really improved as well. I mean, I thought it was great in 2018, but in Ragnarok, they really expanded it in the right areas, gave it some verticality, improved all the different runes and runic, sorry, and special kind of abilities that you can unlock and expand the arsenal um, that you, you can use. And it really adds some new layers into it. When you start to get into the, the zone, as you will, you can really become a, feel like a fucking god, ripping mm. all these poor dregs apart and just absolutely muddering everything in your way <laughs> and it's got all that and then the topic of one of the other things that really it's widely praised for and rightly so is high production values across the board in terms of you know whether it's voice acting cutscenes, animation work enemy Sounds, yeah. enemy variety which is a which is what 2018 was pulled up on big time you know they, they fixed the 
the, the the trolls that just kept being used. I think you thought about fifteen trolls in the in in 2018. Yeah, um, they actually point fun at that during an early part of the game where a troll pops up and you kind of like roll your eyes thinking, "Oh, it's this again." And then Kratos, <laughs> Kratos just fucking axes it in the head and deals with it immediately. And it's like it's almost them saying, "Look, don't worry That's about the trolls." To to ja- yeah, to jab, jab fun at yourself about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the troll and the troll. I think they called it and. Um, yeah, the, so the mini bosses of Far Expand, the actual big boss battles are incredible. Like, they really yeah. are a spectacle to not just watch, but to take part in. Mm-hmm. Um, it balances that, that real fine line of being able to feel like you're partaking in a action sequence that is well above what a standard sort of gameplay encounter would normally offer you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the story, really, is what, was praised in 2018. This was a this is sort of a conclusion to that saga, and they've done a really nice job with that as well. Um, overall narrative was good, but again, the, the strong point for me has always been the characters and bringing all those different characters to life. Got the likes of Odin in this one, Thor, all those kind of gods that you've heard about. Yeah, they really went into the Norse mythology on this one, didn't they? Yeah, for people that love Norse mythology, this was excellent because they... They used the base material, but tweaked it in their own way and, and made it made sense. Yeah. And, um, yeah, across the board, just so such a solid single player, modern action kind of adventure game. Like really just ticks all of the different boxes that you'd want. Um, no online functionality, which would be a game breaker for some people. But if you're looking at a, a well-rounded single player campaign game where you're going to drop the the day one price of 60 or 70 quid this kind of earns it with the amount of content and just the 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 overall consistency across all those areas yeah and what like what a good a fair point there that i mean certainly across our list of the five games that we've we've picked this obviously being number five a strong year for single player campaign games Mm. uh topped off by by this you know um as you say so frequently a a deal breaker for people that they want some kind of online functionality some way of playing either competitively against or with uh, with others yeah and what a testament to you know the titles that like i say that we've selected that i mean i I, forgive me if i'm wrong but i don't think it like mild multiplayer functionality on i know forbidden west had some didn't it and i think elden ring had you could leave mementos for one another or bits yeah, and pieces. Yeah, you, but... you can summon people in Elden Ring, and that's the closest you'll get, though, to, like, in any of these games, to any sort of multiplayer, multiplayer function. That's yeah. a fucking pig to operate. You have to get a bloody finger. You have to drop it somewhere. Then someone has to answer. Like, it's not even it's not even easy to, to do, but... Yeah, that's, it's not that's... like inviting someone to a lobby. It's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a whole fucking rigmarole. Yeah, yeah, and, like, very, very rare that we will have, especially in the Dimp Crew, where I think it's probably, again, a pretty even 50-50 split between yeah. those of us that play exclusively multiplayer or online games against those that play um the single player bits and pieces but what a fucking strong year for the narrative games yeah to have to have five games that arguably any of which could win or take the title um that are all all single player all heavily story driven Mm. not just single player as in like amazing gameplay but single player as in story driven excellently written well acted everything just like the real real complete package on all of them yeah what do you think that is there's not many it's free to play disrupted traditional multiplayer so much that when we come to these sort of discussions i mean the the closest thing we'll we'll, we'll talk about in a second like in a bit more in depth to talk about other games that were mentioned but didn't make it in but Mm. often what i'll see is what people put forward through are expansions for ongoing service-based games like the witch queen for example yeah have those types of games like Destiny just sort of disrupted the market and with the advent of like Apex and Fortnite and Warzone 2.0, they're not really new entries usually of those games. They're new seasons or new changes and people seem to be playing them all year round but not necessarily saying, oh, that's my game of last year though because they've been playing it for probably for five years or up until that point. Yeah, I think so. I think that it's also... Um... The fact that I, I don't know why this is, I don't know why this is a thing, but it, a lot of those, like the big popular online games, take your Call of Duties, <laughs> your Battlefields, FIFAs, whatever it is, you know, a lot of the games that are multiplayer driven, even even Destiny, you know, yeah. which admittedly is slightly different because it's it's 
like you say, it's free to play with online expansions. But there seems to be an expectation that people want an update every single year. Or <laughs> maybe maybe the audience don't even want an update, but the studios feel that it's necessary to provide people with a brand a, a new game every single year. So we churn out this shit over and over again, and I think people are getting put off. The latest Call of Duties have been relatively poorly received by by the uh, the gaming world, like not necessarily by critics, but certainly, I mean, if you ask people about what Warzone's like at the minute, people yeah, don't, don't like enjoy it. it. People are not liking it. Yeah. Um, the last couple of Battlefields have been relatively poorly reviewed, have not been well thought of at all. Oh, that 2042 you know? is a stinker. Exactly. You know, um, FIFA, NBA, Madden, all of these, like what used to be the banker yearly releases are not people are saying well, there's not enough change there's not enough new they what they've tried to introduce what they're trying to force upon us are not changes that we want them to make mm. and I overwatch that, 2 the game that everyone wanted exactly which is basically overwatch 1 like we've just <laughs> taken a character away <laughs> yeah. that's it it's so bizarre that we seem to be for these online games we seem to be churning out yearly releases whether it's working or not people are still like all the studios are still just fucking hammering out a yearly release. Maybe that's because that's what they feel they need to do in order to stay relevant. Mm. But a lot of these single player games that are three, four, five years in development that are coming out and being properly well finished, well polished games yeah. are getting super highly critical, like are being super well regarded amongst the gaming community. At what stage, maybe it is the introduction of free-to-play bits and pieces because there's so many games that are available now that it's just literally like, okay, well, this is a bit shit. I'm going to move on to the next one because they're free. and I, they, yeah. There's no investment, monetary investment, so therefore my time is free. It doesn't matter. It's it's so bizarre. I, just, I wish that we would just take a breath and someone, you know, there's some bits and pieces coming out in the near future that look like they could be doing something along the lines of, but... I just I don't know. It's it's bizarre that we seem to be, feel that it's acceptable for a so a single player game to have three, four, five years in development, and yet these massive online or any kind of online game, we're just like, oh no, we'll churn out the yearly. The only exception to that rule that I've seen for recent times is is Grand Theft Auto, where mm. Rockstar are like, yeah, we aren't getting fucking rushed for shit. Like we're gonna do what yeah. we want to do when we want to fucking do it, and it'll be amazing. But you'll have to wait for it. Yeah. Um. You know, it's. I, I just don't get it. I don't get why we're still pump like punishing ourselves with these shit yearly updates that no one really likes, and yet those of us that are online gamers are like, well, I guess I'll have to play it because it's fucking nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Trouble is, the silent majority just do play these games and make bank for them. So it just, yeah. it's almost like, why wouldn't oh, yeah. you? <laughs> well, this is it. I mean, like I say that you know, Warzone Two is poorly regarded. You know. How much money do you reckon Warzone 2 has made yeah, yeah. in comparison to Elden Ring? Yeah, it's probably not even like, close, is it? Yeah, exactly, because people are buying fucking... I mean, and it will continue to make that money consistently yeah, exactly. for many years. Like, the latest thing on War, one of the latest things on Warzone is you can buy a fucking Paul Pogba skin or, or, <laughs> or a Lionel Messi skin, and you can run around in fucking wherever it's meant to be set and yeah. shoot people as Paul Pogba. Like, what the fuck's that about? Well, seriously, what world are we in where that is, where that's what people want now? But people buy them. People fucking buy it. They do. And it annoys the living shit out of me. Yeah. But there you go. I remember Logan moaning about some skin that they put into Warzone, and it was like yeah. it was like a skin that was really dark, and people were, they were buying it to get a competitive advantage. Yeah, and exactly. It, that started to irritate him because um, they knew what they said. He, knew, he knows what they, they know what they're doing. Like yeah. they're putting in this. Oh, 100%. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Those people yeah, 100%. Will want any advantage they can get. <laughs> we'll yeah, just, exactly. We'll pay 20 quid or whatever it is for the skin. I don't know how much they are. But... Oh, they're extortionate. <laughs> they are like 20 quid as well. Fucking hell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so going back to that, why, if it was a business, why would you say, let's build a new game for 100 million quid when we can sell this skin for 20 quid a pop and yeah. make <laughs> almost as much with how much effort? Yeah. Four yeah, percent of the effort it. required. It's crazy, but um, no, oh, that's a uh, rant over for Hall then. Fuming. Yeah, there you go. Walk Abs away. Another interesting thing about this list is that four of the five games on this list either started or still are on in the console space. PlayStation exclusive. Is there a bias in the dimp ranks, or is it just a state of perhaps Nintendo and Microsoft didn't have the big hitters popping out? 
to resonate because we know Nintendo's going to have one this year. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. And Xbox yeah. should have one this year as well, whether it's, and it's Starfield and, and Breath of the Wild, uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom we're talking about. But last year, was it a, is it a bias or were they just not at the races? I don't think it's... I, I, I don't think many people would pick... I, I think you can argue with the five games that we've got on our, we've mm-hmm. got on our list. I don't think many people would be. I think it'd be hard pressed to say that any of them don't warrant a space, especially not the 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 main PlayStation exclusives. Obviously, of Horizon, God of War, and Elden Ring. Like, it's hard to argue those three. Elden Ring actually, Elden Ring came out. Elden Ring multi Yes, that's, that's the only one that was. Um, that was across multi- the board, wasn't it? Proper multi Yeah. Yeah. So, but <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe it's because. Microsoft have been focusing on acquiring studios as part of their whole yeah. Game Pass yeah. like grand plan. You know, I, I have absolutely no doubt that it will start to reap benefits for Xbox in the future when Bethesda start pumping stuff out. And you know, they are only going to acquire more. It's you know, yeah. it's not it's not it's not a, a hiding fact. There's going to be more bits and pieces that are going to come out to Xbox. There's the other side of it that is now pretty much everything is xbox slash pc yeah um yeah. and if you're already i can only assume that most of it is obviously designed for pc and then a port is made across to a console so if you're already porting across to xbox why would you cut off half your audience why not just port it across to ps5 as well mm. um so i think that's got a little bit to to play with it but i mean there's just not been a huge amount of first party like first party microsoft stuff at least um mm. coming out this year I think Nintendo have had a relatively quiet year in terms of there's not been any big, what you'd call like traditional Nintendo IPs like a Mario, like a big Mario or a, or a Zelda or. Mm. You, That's you they're two Pokemon games though, which is ridiculous in a year. Yeah, and they've <laughs> uh, have both been relatively tough, haven't they? I mean. <laughs> I think, wise, they're awful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe that's the limitations of the Switch, unfortunately, that, mm. you know, certainly I, if you ask some of the Dimp crew, they'd rather play Switch games on their Steam Deck than they would do <laughs> on, on fucking Switch, which I think is, says quite a lot, doesn't it, again? Yeah. Rather emulate a first-party game and play it on a different different platform. But, um, yeah, I think, I think both will have a stronger year this year, as yeah. you say, with Tears of the Kingdom coming out and Starfield. Um, assuming Starfield comes, but um, Tears of the Kingdom certainly will. I think that will do. That will be exceptionally strongly reviewed. Um, yeah, that'll be the next Oxygen's sucker, won't it? When that comes yeah, out, that'll be the next. Like, that'll be the next one. The, like, the when, we, when we're sat here next year, yeah, I'd be very, very surprised if that's not lurking. Oh well, yeah, you know, top five game of all time on Open Critic kind of kind oh, yeah. of jobber. I'd yeah. be very surprised if it's not right up there because. They just do it right when it comes to that those games. I really hope I am not putting the fucking kiss of death on it, and it is <laughs> it is as good as I hope it's going to be because I've been waiting for it. Like I'm looking forward to playing it again. I'm looking forward to jumping back into it. So yeah, but I don't know. I, I mean, how many of the group of how many out of the Dimp boys have got a Series X? So it'd be me, yourself, yeah. Logan. Adkins. I know Salmon's got one. He might not, so maybe him, but I know Parky hasn't. No. I suppose um, that it's how many how many more PlayStation 5s are there out there in like of those of those that you've mentioned that have got Series X, we've all got PS5s as well, right? Yeah, I think there's that oh yeah, Xbox only. I don't think there's many at all, if any. No, I don't um, think there's any. There's a few well, Salmon's got stuff, but he just plays on Pete. I don't know why he bothers. I mean, well, much like yourself, actually. He's got, got two, got both of them sitting there. I would... That's never had a game installed on it. <laughs> Literally not a single game has been installed on that Xbox Series X. And the PS5, I think, has had... <laughs> yeah, one game, which was NBA. <laughs> Not even an exclusive. No, I could have played yeah. it anywhere. And I've played it more on PC than I have done yeah. on. I and, bought and, it on PC as well. And don't they so, put the last gen version on PC as well? Is to really fuck the yeah. PC crowd up. <laughs> yeah. So thousand quid's worth of console there, and their base, and that fucking fridge which yeah. still isn't plugged in because so you bad. told me it fucking makes a racket. It does make so a racket. Fucking, so I chinned it. Yeah. Like fucking hell! What a fucking state! <laughs> Ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 
I think we do. I think there are not many people that have just an Xbox only. And you've got a couple of people that have only a PlayStation, which might sway the figures somewhat, I guess. But I don't think it was enough. I think generally they just didn't. There wasn't. There was more compelling stuff. Um, and like seafood's on all platforms now. I assume Stray will be on all platforms one day, so they won't stay exclusive. But they just, it was just no. interesting. They they seem to secure good games on that on the console platform. And for those on PC that were playing it, they got access to pretty much all this stuff and will get access to it in the future if they didn't didn't last year. So yeah, um, just an interesting like stat there. Because usually it'd be filled with a lot of third party games, like a Star Wars game or you know, it could even be a, a Destiny expansion, but um it was a bit of a, a bit of a difference in, in twenty twenty two. Before we reveal the actual winner of this bloody contest, there's a couple of games that were nominated but didn't make the actual list. So I was wondering the if cut. Make, didn't make the cut. A quick shout out. First one will boil your pierce. Guild Wars 2, End of Dragons, the expansion. I think this is the final expansion for like the start of that story that he's been playing for like 10 years now. This is unsurprisingly papers, you know, effort of putting stuff forward. I think almost every year he puts forward. I was just about to say this. How many years in a row have we had some fucking pissy bit of Guild Wars nominated? Yeah, and uh, it never makes it list. And realise they never get through. What we do is read it and go, well, instant no. It wouldn't even matter. It could be a fucking, the new wow. I wouldn't put it forward. <laughs> Not interested. So Ender Dragons didn't make it, and Paper will continue to play that on his own, <laughs> whilst no one else goes there <laughs> to, to play this MMO <laughs> with him. Um, and then the other game, which was, which was put forward a couple of times, was Destiny 2, and, you know, more... Um, explicitly the the witch queen expansion which mm-hmm. reviewed very very well um, 88 and the right. eight, yeah in the 88s and ended up being a bit of a i would say a sensation for destiny because people that are in that community were absolutely loving the witch queen and just another quick fact both ender dragons and the witch queen expansions guess what month they came out February. Mm, yeah. <laughs> what is going on in February of 2022? Yeah. Um, but you're, you're, you're in a good place to speak about the Witch Queen and, and Destiny 2. And also yeah. Lightfall, which has kind of come after it, which has not been as well received at all, if you look just at the, the critical reception. Yeah. Um, but the Witch Queen certainly seemed like it did something pretty special in the Destiny community. Yeah, first time that they've done... Well, no, not first time, but the first time in a while they've done an expansion which... I think has ticked a lot of boxes for everyone that's playing it. Um, Decent, decent amount of story content, decent actual storyline itself. um, And good raid, good, good end game content. That's, that's kind of necessary for the hardcores that are playing, playing destiny. Um, Lightfall has fallen short on pretty much all of the above that I've just mentioned, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's, I could have argued the toss that that Witch Queen should have possibly been on the list, but mm. it's very difficult when when you're the only one that really has played it. I know obviously D Man played it a bit, um, yeah. But yeah, it's hard for me to say like, oh yeah, no, this is this is absolute grade A one content. Um, when I know that I've enjoyed it a lot, but in the same way that Paper puts his Guild Wars forward every year, you know, it's. It'd be unfair of me to uh, unless I feel super strongly about something like I did with Fire Emblem Three Houses last yeah, yeah. year. Yeah, um, I'm not going to fight the corner that if only one of us has played it, then it should it deserves to be on the list. Especially when I think the final like I basically said I had a deciding vote on what to put on, and I was yeah. more than happy to vote for for Elden Ring to make the list um, yeah. than push for push for Witch Queen, yeah. uh, assuming that everyone else came up with with decent picks like i, I wasn't going to let witch queen be beaten out by some shit but i think the five <laughs> i think the five games that did make the final list i'm quite happy for all of them to have been considered above above the witch queen i don't feel bad about that at all no fair enough and then next year obviously there's another expansion already penned in for destiny and i think it'll be the final one for the light and dark story arc what are expectations like there now they're under sony stewardship as well which was a big change from last year that happened halfway through i don't think that's had a major difference at all but what's what's the destiny community feeling now you had this the high of the witch queen a bit of a a middling one with lightfall is it just gonna it doesn't matter they're all like it's just it's not it's a miserable community it's like a you can't win 
like the proper truth. Like I was, watching, there's a video the other day of um, Dato who's complaining about the the raid and how it was too easy day one. Um, wow. Yeah, the thing is, like, his point is that, you know, it's meant to be the absolute cream of the crop that do the raid day one. It's meant to be the hardest content. And that's fine, but by doing that, you alienate, like, 99.99999% of the fucking population that plays it. Well, that's what happened Whereas, to our group, basically. Our original raid group, just after Argos, just got fractured. and was like, I ain't nah, dealing with that so again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that wasn't even... That was that, that's <laughs> like a standard raid. Yeah. Which... That's what's great about it. Like the the standard raids are hard enough that um, that if you're not semi coherent between the six of you, you'll struggle. Yeah. yeah. Um. So by making the day one raid like a little bit more accessible to everyone, I think they did the right thing for the community as a whole. But like the proper few, like elitist few, um, really kicked off about it and didn't like it. So, you know, it's. I mean, it swings and roundabouts. They're, they're, like I say, they're a fucking miserable... We're a miserable bunch. We're never really that happy about it. So we shall wait and see. I think... Everyone will buy it. <laughs> it wants to finish it off. Exactly. Everyone's just going to fucking play it. No one's really playing it for, like, the story that much. Like, there's a few, like Dave, who love the story and the fucking lore and everything, and he's got a bit disheartened by Lightfall because loads of it just doesn't make sense and they've not fucking explained any of it. No. Um which the Witch Queen did a really good job of, but yeah. I don't think it really matters that much. Like I say, we're all going to fucking be here. We're all going to be playing it. It's just that every time a new one comes out as well, everything you've done up to that point is just completely pointless. Flushed. It's like you could join, you could start playing it tomorrow and it would take you two weeks to get to where I'm at. Yeah. Whereas I've been playing it solidly for the last fucking four years. <laughs> And like I say, I've been grinding week in, week out to do everything. And yeah. you would, yeah, you'd catch me in no time at all. Might take you up on that just to annoy you. So no, could happen. <laughs> could happen. So there we go. They've got a bit of Guild Wars 2 expansion and Destiny 2 <laughs> expansion lurking, but didn't quite make the grade. It's time for the all important. I always, I don't put much stock in the actual winner. I think I'm more interested about the five nominees, but we do crown a winner. Um, goes down to a vote on the on the committee. Uh, this was a very close vote, as Bush, people yeah. might um, expect. No one was really willing to budge, which I think is fair enough when we get to this stage. And ultimately, it had to be sort of <laughs> ranked on how much people had played and versus you know other people that had played and done like a point system. And in yeah, the I, end, go on. Sorry, I was just like I in that discussion, I basically said like, I haven't played either of them. Yeah. Or any of the like it basically came down to one of two, didn't it? Yeah. Um and I said I hadn't played either of them, so I don't feel like my vote should be Yeah. Valued as highly as someone like yourself who's played both of them through to completion. Because it'd be unfair for me to have a winning vote over <laughs> on something that I haven't even played, you yeah. know? So yeah. but it was so close and that's this is the first time that's happened, I think. I think so. Where we've yeah. been so close. Like normally we've been able to have an open discussion and someone's gone yeah okay fine i'm happy with that like yeah. that's not a problem but this time it was pretty pretty staunch in the no this is where we're at we are <laughs> none of us are fucking changing so yeah. we had to wait put, put weight on the votes basically yeah and where that turned out was that god of war ragnarok upsets the apple cart and takes home the 2022 dimp digital game of the year award the sony, title sony santa monica looking forward to their wrestling belt for, for yeah. that. Imagine if it did that, go under, be bankrupt. But that's it. But no, they've managed to pip out. Well, unsurprisingly, the other game was Elden Ring. It was. It came. You know, the other the other three games were good. I think we all agreed they should be on the list, and was like, yeah, we're happy with that list. But ultimately, when we had to choose like what we thought was our favourite or, or perhaps the best, these were the two heavyweights that were battling it out. Um, yeah. I mean, and to give that some context, don't forget Forbidden West was on there, which is considered a heavyweight wasn't even really a discussion really i was about, like yeah. no to be honest it was you know below those two easily in in you know that i'd played and certainly elden ring and god of war were the two of the best two of the two of the two or maybe three of the best games i played last year um but god of war won out how do you feel about that uh i'm fine with it i was uh, i'll be honest i was um team elden ring yeah as I say, having not played either of them, difficult for me to say um, that absolutely one or or other should have won. Um, I don't feel bad that that God of War took the title. I think they were both epic. The only reason that 
led me towards Elden Ring was just... I think um, maybe it was because it was slightly different to the, the predecessors in terms of its popularity. Yeah. But I had, like, people at work who know that I play a lot of video games would be like, oh, have you played Elden Ring yet? Asking like, about have it. You played El- have you played Elden Ring? Yeah. And I'd be like, no. And they'd all say, oh, it's fucking amazing. It's so good. It's so good. And it, I'd be like, oh, cool. Did you, like, have you enjoyed, like, previous iterations, like the Soulsborne games? And they're like, what are they? <laughs> it's like it's, it, it did such it did a good job for a game that's as difficult as it is it did a really good job of bringing people in yeah to a style and genre of game that not a lot of people would normally play um that said i don't think that anyone could begrudge ragnarok from taking the win the, just an absolute powerhouse like i don't think there's many things that you'd look at that game and say it did it didn't do unbelievably well mm. like you say right from Gameplay and and storyline to voice acting to um, just absolutely absolutely everything it was obviously an absolute powerhouse. Santa Monica have got an unbelievable track record, and you know this God of War series is absolutely epic, and you can tell that by by the critical like the big the big um, game awards ceremonies across the board. This was this was right up there alongside Elden Ring, um, but yeah, no no qualms with it taking the win. I think. Those of you that played it, there wasn't anyone that didn't enjoy it. So yeah, tip of my cap. What a worthy winner! Yeah, it was just it was just an excellent experience from start to finish. It was very. I'd almost I could nitpick. You could nitpick any game, but I had no fundamental issues or flaws that really I was yeah. I was concerned or bothered about. The fact that yeah. they decided to do it in two games rather than three means that this game is packed full of value everything like there is yeah and some people say it's too much but then my response is well it's optional like you don't have to do it all like yeah that's it it yeah. goes much you want but it really is just an epic <laughs> adventure from start to finish and continues the great form as you said that sony santa monica have kind of got since since 2018 super interested to see what they do next um considering yeah. they've, they've kind of closed this chapter or have they i don't know um and you'd think that it's a prequel. Yeah, I, my concern is that I think this. I mean, they do a third game. It won't be as. I mean, this was even on the just slightly. This was slightly scored less than um than what twenty eighteen did. I think you'll start to see the law of diminishing returns more prevalent in a third entry if they don't shake it up again. So yeah. I'll be tempted to see that. I'd like to see them do something completely different, but. I think they're happy to work on God of War and, yeah. and try and tweak what they've got there. But as, as far as Ragnarok's concerned, yeah, it's excellent. I mean, you know, it really did tick all of the boxes that typically I would look for in a game. Yeah. Um, nice sort of linear and open structure, nice little hybrid there, nice linear levels to work your way through, mix in some puzzles, combat's so good. The axe is just... The trouble is, it's easy to... I could sit there and you sort of just go, yeah, it's expected with God of War, it's that good, without mm. really taking the time to say, actually, just the axe alone is still excellent. Like, yeah. Having that there is just... A yeah, awesome, a real victim of awesome his own work. success. In a way, yeah, because it's, it, it's so easy just to say, well... It just don't give it credit time. where it's due sometimes, yeah. No, but sitting down and playing that game was, was a joy from start to finish. And But really, the other four games, Sifu, Horizon Forbidden West, Elden Ring... Stray rounded up what I thought was a decent year. Um, perhaps not oh, the, sure. the greatest year of all time. I don't know if we'll ever get one of those, but certainly in <laughs> in that February period, in the first half of the year, there was lots to play. And there were lots of other games that didn't get mentioned or put forward that people people really enjoyed as well. There was tons tons of variety on offer of all different levels. And yeah, two of those games in our list are actually smaller budget indie games. Like there wasn't five big AAA games that you'd put forward that you may have done in previous years. But I think that was good because you would not see um, the amount of money spent on Stray as God of War. Like you wouldn't see yeah. Oh, that, yeah. that mean, game's just... That this, no one's going to pump that much... Region, are you? No, that, no one's going to pump that much money into something like Stray. No one's going to pump that amount of money into Sifu. But the fact they can still arrive on not just our list, but other people's and, and community lists is, is great to see. So yeah. whilst the AAA game's always going to have the edge because of the budget and the the polish that they'll have. There's always room for these, you know, and these are great, Smaller. big quality. These are high quality, smaller titles as well. It's gone on the days of like, and I'm not dissing Super Meat Boy, but 
you know, Look, games felt like, like an indie feel feels like, like an indie game. Yeah, you could pass these off as not non indie completely, and um, you've got debuts in there and all sorts. But I thought that was a good year of 2022. I'm looking forward. Obviously, we're sort of part way through 2023. We'll see how that pairs. But Hall, oh, I think you can now go back to the cave. And basically prop up the Twitch channel yourself by streaming what it seems to be Destiny at the moment. And we'll bring you back in a year or so to see what, what other games people have been squabbling about for the year 2023. Sounds good. Excellent. So everyone that's listening, thanks for sticking with us if you're watching also. Hopefully my audio sync is half sorted because um, I have noticed in recent weeks on the YouTube video, I was out of sync slightly and it's really bothering me. And rather than just look up the solution, I just asked Dave. Yeah, he, make he, Dave look up the solution. Make Dave look up the solution. And it was what I thought it was, but I just wanted him to tell me. And this, some of the tests I ran looked like it had resolved it. I may well have cocked it up and people were watching it going, no, you've made it worse. So You've made it worse. You've made it worse, but I'm, I'm pleased to have got that sorted. But those that are just listening don't give a toss anyway. In fact, that's most people. So yeah. all the effort put into the video stuff really is a waste of time. But Walked now, away. Now it's been started, we have to continue. Anyway, That's Hall, it. we'll see you in a year or so. And if you want to listen to Hall more, he's on the Twitch channel more than anyone else. So twitch.tv slash Digital. He's in a bit of a Destiny mood at the moment, but we've seen him playing Warzone. I've played a bit of Orcs with him in the past and uh, wonder what other games he's going to be lurking on his menu. But I would imagine he's Destiny for the next sort of few weeks until he really does hate that game. Mm, um, if he doesn't... Far. If he's... <laughs> He basically plays it too much and then gets sick of it. Gets it's annoyed and then has to take a break from it and get annoyed and fucking walk away. It's always got to be done. Anyway, Crossly. nothing more for us to say other than thanks for your time and ta -da. This was a Dimp Digital production.